they used it to stuff their own pockets because when they were helping the Greek government simultaneously, they were betting against uh, some of these credit default swaps and made money off of it for the ruins of, of Greece. The president of the EU recently stated that Greece is, quote, on the verge of being unable to pay for their schools and hospitals. The entire political establishment including a nominally socialist party, insists that there is no alternative to the latest bailout bill, which is in reality a bailout of the banks. So the head of the government briefly floated the idea of putting the so-called bailout of the Greek economy up to a vote in a referendum. He did this not because he believes in democracy or because he opposes the bailout, he's in favor of it, he, he did it as a kind of a sordid political maneuver to buy his own government a little bit more time uh, in power. As soon as the proposal for the referendum was even floated, the markets went down the toilet. Why? Because he was very clear that if this decision is left up to the democratic wills of the Greek people, there's no chance in hell that this is a democracy. No matter how much the existing political establishment might push for. And so, lo and behold, rumors of a coup began to be heard. Uh, Forbes magazine, which is proudly characterizes itself as the capitalist tool, ran an article titled, quote, The Real Greek Solution, a Military Coup. This was not, this was, it had a level of plausible deniability because the guy was saying, well, you know, of course, no one is really seriously, but, you know, it's that kind of article. <laughs> now, what happened, what happened is that actually the head of the Greek government was compelled to call to his office all the heads of the armed forces in Greece, including Army, Navy, uh, Air Force, and the, basically the head of the, the equivalent of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Kandam replaced every single one of them. In other words, this was not a joke. There must have been reasons to believe that the rumors of the coup were, about the coup were being folded for a reason. The New York Times contributed to this with an article you might remember in 2002. They celebrated a little too quickly the coup in Venezuela and then were, were compelled to come to the Eastern program. Of course, you might also remember that between 1967 and 74, there was a bloody military regime that was in power in Greece, supported by uh, NATO and the United States. There's a famous quote uh, by the head of the CIA in Athens, who was basically told that the coup represented a rape of democracy. How can we, how can we support this? He famously responded, "Well, how can you rape a whore?" Which, forgive the language, but this provides a sense of the kind of democratic sensibilities of the of the uh, people in power in this country. The referendum proposal was, of course, quickly shelved, but now it looks like they reshuffled the government coalition to carry out the same austerity measures. Adding insult to injury, of course, Greece is significant because democracy happened to be historically invented there, and, there, and, and I think that's an important point that needs to be made. Uh, what does this little sad vignette illustrate, particularly when it comes to essential matter of economic decisions and economic policy? There is no democracy. Not. The entire political establishment, including organizations that characterize themselves as socialists, are effectively representing the interests of the banks, the interests of the IMF, uh, etc., not the interests of the people. And moreover, because of these rumors about the coup, it becomes also clear that the ruling class is finding even the very limited forms of what I call bourgeois or capitalist democracy to be increasingly intolerable. This is not just true in Greece, it's true actually in many different countries. Even the ritualistic voting for a bourgeois parliament comes to present certain dangers from their standpoint. Now this happened in the past few days, but it's not the first time the issue has been raised. Historically, the socialist movement <coughs> Well, not just for political democracy, as I tried to explain, but they also fought for what they call social democracy. And this meant exactly what turns out to be impossible under capitalism today. Expanding the scope of democratic decision-making to the field of the economy. 
the social question in social democracy means quite simply the issue of jobs, the issue of health, the issue of education, housing, etc. To apply democracy to the social question means to get what we don't have a very meaningful form of democratic control over these decisions. Now, of course, the more far sighted sections of the socialist movement understood very well that to attain social democracy meant that society had to be transformed radically. It's not a question of reforming or even taking over the existing capitalist institutions. It was rather a question of inventing, so to speak, experimenting new forms of democratic rule and representation which would be appropriate to the scale and the class character of the task. Now this is a, a, a kind of, historically may seem like a quaint little archival kind of footnote, but it is of some significant, significance that when the capitalist class came to power in the United States and France and elsewhere, they could not simply inherit the existing institutions of the monarchy and, and, and feudal aristocracy. They had to invent and implement new ones. In the same way, uh, the working class international will be compelled to invent and experiment in new uh, forms of uh, uh, democracy. Not for, for the sake of novelty, but because the existing structures, forms, and institutions, as we noted at the beginning, simply no longer uh, uh, satisfy its, its aspirations. At every turn, as I said earlier, they block any kind of minimal progress that may be uh, accomplished. Now, Occupy as a movement. Just a quick question. Can you, can you maybe touch on uh, what uh, the, the Stalinist trade unions uh, protecting parliament right now are in league with the government, do you know anything about that? Or is that uh, pertaining, is that yeah, relevant to what you're talking about? Unfortunately, it opens up a massive kit. Okay. Sorry. You mean, what do you mean, the, the Stalinist Union? Yes. You That's mean today? Today. Well, I'm not aware of any. Do you mean in Greece? In Greece? Yes, in Greece. Oh, I see. Uh, at the, can, can I maybe get yeah, back to it at the end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it actually happens to be a question that's critical because in the same way, I think that uh, there are certain organizations that call themselves socialists and are understood to be fighting for that. But in fact, they don't, like the uh, party, the ruling party in Greece. One has to, by this time, by 2011, come to certain definitive conclusions as to the class nature of the trade unions in Greece as well as here. And there's a, a multiple kind of a rich field of experience where one could kind of gauge that question. And the question is probably could be phrased as, are the trade unions a suitable tool in the hands of working people to fight for their rights? I believe the answer, certainly in 2011, is absolutely not. But that's unfortunately a, a very complicated matter, which I can't deal with. So now Occupy has been experimenting with various procedures and forms, all in the name of a more meaningful democracy. You know, different uh, norms and, and procedures have been invented, so to speak, uh, tested out, revised. I think this is a, an extremely healthy process. The extent to which various models and procedures are viable is still being debated, but no matter what the specific uh, procedures that are uh, chosen, no matter what that might be, and even no matter what the subjective intentions of the people who are involved in these experiments might be, the fact of the matter is that all of these attempts to create new democratic forms ultimately are a way of posing the fundamental question, who should rule in society? Should it be the bankers and the speculators and the hedge fund managers and their political representatives and the generals, etc., Or should it be working? The immense majority of the population. And behind a lot of the discussions concerning this or that model of more, more genuine representation rests that fundamental question, which hasn't necessarily been tackled head on, but I think will become more and more sharply in focus as we move forward. As I said, this is not the first time that the working class is confronted with the question of who will rule in society and which uh, forms are the necessary and appropriate. I will very, very briefly 
discuss two crucial historical experiences in which the working class created new forms. But just very briefly, because I think it's probably already. Um, one is the Paris Commune in 1871. The other one is the Soviets in Russia in 1905 and 1917. Now, why go back to the archives, so to speak? If nothing else, I think we have to appreciate the extent to which these experiences were very much part of the political DNA of working people. But at the same time, working people don't know about them because they have been snuffed out by many different ways, whether it was falsification, lies, violence, etc. In other words, the very ex historical experience of the working class has been uh, erased to a significant degree from their consciousness. So the fact that most working people are not aware of the Paris Commune and the Soviet and what the Soviets really are or how they function is not their fault. It's that it's part and parcel of the kind of hegemony of the ruling class. Uh, so these experiences res deserve respect and careful study for which I, what I will say now can only just serve as encouragement. You know, we're not going to explain the Paris Commune in, in, in five minutes. <laughs> However, we will say a couple of things about it. This commune happened in 1871 at a time of great crisis, particularly there was a war between France and Prussia. The Prussian armies were at the gates of Paris. The uh, government of France has essentially given up. Working people in Paris rise up and have a different opinion on the matter. They actually uh, seize power in the city. Uh, and in the process of doing this, they really invent a new way of democratic rule and, and representation. This is a significant event because it was the first historical moment when the working class came to power, however fleetingly, because I was, as I'll mention in a second, it didn't last bit. Instead of flying the tricolor, instead of being kind of captive to various forms of nationalism, chauvinism, etc., the commune in Paris raised, uh, raised, uh, uh, raised the flag, the, the, a red flag, a new flag. Um, the commune lasted for three months, at the end of it, the French bourgeois government and the German occupying army collaborated to crush it. It was crushed in blood. 30,000 workers were massacred during an orgy of non-stop executions that lasted for eight days. The working people had dared to come to power and rule themselves. They were, they were going to have to pay for this. 7,000 of them were shipped as indentured laborers to the French colonies in the South Pacific. This was a, 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 a brutal response on the part of the, uh, of the capitalist uh, and their states. Now, in reviewing the lessons of the Paris Commune, Lenin wrote that this represented the expansion of democracy, which for the first time becomes democracy for the poor, democracy <coughs> for the people, and not democracy for the rich. At the same time, however, and this is an absolutely necessary element of political realism, which, which we'll have to learn, and hopefully sooner rather than later. Lenin also said that simultaneously, with an immense expansion of democracy, it was also necessary to impose a series of restrictions on the freedom of the oppressors, the exploiters, and the capitalists. In other words, no revolution has ever been attained by asking politely. Uh, revolution, as Marx called it, is the locomotive of history. Every kind of, even every kind of scrap of reform, in, in one way or another, can be traced to the propulsive effect of revolution attempts. And revolution is in the business of replacing one form of government with another. Again, not by 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 asking kindly. This is not this is not the historical experience. Now, the commune had a peculiar way of functioning. It was not a bourgeois parliament. This is why I'm raising it as a, a significant experience. Uh, how did it work? For this, go to Marx, important work called The Civil War in France. This is a longish book. It gives you all the essential elements of the ways in which 
the coming function as a democratic, a new form of democratic rule and representation. Quote, the commune was formed of the municipal councils, 